Good morning, Green Acres. It is so, so very good to see y'all. Have I told y'all lately that I love you? Glory to God. Y'all, let's rise up and let's worship our newborn king and let's sing Go Tell It on the Mountain. Merry Christmas! I know Christmas is over, but it's still Christmas season. So uh, you guys can go on and be seated. I told somebody earlier in the lobby, that's the last time you have to hear me say it until at least the first Sunday of November, right? So uh, you guys can... Uh, you guys can get by with it just one. I hope you had a great Christmas. I know some of you still have Christmases planned coming up, family still coming in, or maybe you're traveling, and we hope uh, that you're having a great Christmas. I hope everybody got enough food to eat yesterday. Uh, you know, I always, I always say that, you know, I know today is Boxing Day on the calendar. It should be uh, sweatpants day, right? Everybody wears a little bit more elastic around the middle, right? Uh, we had a great Christmas. Uh, looking forward to continuing the Christmas season. A couple things I want to remind you uh, in the bulletin. Um, just because of the holiday season, the office, the church office is closed tomorrow. Uh, and so I uh, just wanted you to be aware of that. And then also Wednesday night, there is no adult Bible study uh, or youth uh, open gym. So Wednesday night, there's not anything because of the holidays. Um, but next Sunday, we kick everything back off, okay? So next Sunday, we start Sunday school. We start worship, everything back at regular. Uh, it will be the new year, so we want to start everything off well with that. Um, speaking of the new year, uh, on your back, there's a couple things uh, that uh, Pearl's Luncheon um, is starting Go Back Potluck on January 6th. Be thinking about uh, what super sandwich you want to bring for that. Uh, and then also on the back, uh, notice that we will be taking a love offering for Pastor Micah and his family up through January 9th. And then also on January 9th, um, we are planning a going away party from 4 to 6. So I know you guys uh, will want to bless the Emory family and be here on the 9th. So make sure you get that on your calendar. Um, know what's, what's happening then. Also, I want to uh, remind you that today is really the last day uh, that you can grab one of these Hebrew books before we start. Um, January 1 through January 30th, every year. I love reading through a book with you guys. Uh, and this, this year we're doing Hebrews. Uh, so we divided the book of Hebrews up into 30 days. Really, it's just a couple verses a day. Uh, and so uh, it's a great way to kick off your new year. Uh, I know last year we, we did one. 
Uh, we did John, I think, John. And then, um, then we also, um, several of you, joined me in reading the Bible through a year. Uh, and that is tough. That is really, really tough. Uh, and we are about to finish up. Some of you have finished up already. Um, but with this, it's a great way for anybody. Anybody can join and read one book of the Bible in 30 days. And so I encourage you to grab one of these books. You can do it alone. You can do it as a family. You can do it as a couple. Uh, and so with this, walking through this, not only will you be reading through the book of Hebrews, um, but every day uh, I'll post a video on Facebook and on YouTube. Uh, uh, of just a quick video, five, six minutes uh, of me explaining what you read and maybe a devotional thought off what you read. Uh, it's just kind of really just kind of a, a, a kind of a primer, right, of just getting you in God's Word and seeing what God's Word can do. Uh, we all know that we should be reading God's Word. We all know we should be praying. But man, if we could all do the same thing at the same time, man, I think God will, will bless uh, all of us as Green Acres as we're doing this. Uh, so on your way out, please pick up a, a Hebrews booklet. Uh, it, it is just something just to remind you of reading it through. Uh, and those videos will start January 1. Uh, and so lots of things are going uh, on. I'm excited for the new year. Um, lots of things um, are, are, are looking bright. Uh, even though it's a dreary day, I'm excited. I hope you're excited. Now, I know uh, Christmas is kind of over, but... Here's what I want you to do. I want you to stand up, greet somebody around you, and I want you to tell that person what was the best thing you ate yesterday, all right? Christmas dinner, what was that one thing you're just like, mm, that was good. Stand up, tell somebody what was the best thing you ate yesterday. Well, now I'm hungry. I'm really hungry now. <laughs> Thank you for that one, Sean. <laughs> Great question. Great, great question. I thought, I thought Nicole's was the most interesting. Her favorite thing yesterday was popcorn. They always go to the movies. So there you go. She had movie popcorn. Oh, nice. Well, y'all, as we continue to celebrate this season, the reality of this season is that it's not just about the birth. The reality is it's the gift of salvation. And this next song we're going to sing celebrates literally every stage of Christ's life here on earth. And, uh, and then, of course, the glorious day that we'll be with him in heaven one day. It's the whole reason for what we do this season. Y'all, let's worship together as we sing Glorious Day.
my sins far away. Rising in justified, free me forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. Living he loved me, dying he saved me. Bearing he carried, my sins far away. that great news living he loved me and dying he saved me what an awesome awesome God y'all worshiping as we sing Emmanuel Thank you so much for stepping out of heaven, sending your son Jesus to come to this earth, to be our example, to fulfill the complete entire Old Testament, that he would be perfect, that he would be sinless, so that at one day in our faith, when we believe in the name of Jesus Christ, that we could stand before you and be declared righteous and be declared sons and daughters of the one true king. Father, we thank you that while we were still sinners, while we were still running from us, you knew our name, you loved us, and you pursued us. That, Father, even though Christmas Day might be over, the reason and the ability to tell of Jesus coming to earth is not over. Help us to keep continuing to tell everyone that we possibly can see that we can talk to that you loved us so much that you sent your son Jesus to this earth so that we may have a relationship with you. Father, we thank you for what you've done. We thank you as we continue in worship, as we give back, that you will remind us that Jesus is truly the only reason for this season. In your name, amen. Joy. 
into the world the Lord is coming let earth receive her King let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing and heaven Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let men his songs employ. While fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. Repeat the sounding. Before we begin, since this is Aunt Bethany's 80th Christmas, I think she should lead us in the saying of grace. Oh, oh, great. Oh. What, dear? Grace! Grace! She passed away 30 years ago. They want you to say grace. The blessing! I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
Amen. 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 <sighs> Catherine, this turkey tastes half as good as it looks. I think we're all in for a very big treat. <laughs> Save the neck for me, Clark. OK, Eddie. Why are you crying? Oh, I told you we put it in too early. Oh, it's just a little dry. It's fine. I, I told you. It. You know, is it Christmas if you don't have National Lampoon's Christmas, right? And so, you know, why, why would we show a clip like that? The, the point is, is Christmas is, is over, right? I mean, some of you are still going to celebrate. Maybe there's some more family that's coming in, or maybe you need to go somewhere or some presents somewhere that hasn't been opened yet. But for the most part, Christmas is over. And the question is, did Christmas go the way that you wanted it to? You know, did, did, was your turkey a little dry? Maybe you were sitting around with your family and you're just, you know, they said the Pledge of Allegiance instead of, uh, instead of the prayer. Uh, how did your Christmas go? You know, I, I can tell you last week leading up into Christmas, I, I came home. And uh, as I pull in my driveway, and this normally doesn't happen, there's a mixer in the front yard. Uh, Laura's KitchenAid mixer is in the front yard, and just sitting in the grass. And I'm like, okay, this, does, this has never happened before. And I go inside, and I said, um, this is a weird question. Why, why is the mixer sitting out in the front yard? And she says, because it was on fire. Okay, well, there you go. And I'm like, did you, did you like extinguish it? And then it's like, no, we just threw it out. Great. So she not only is my mixer on fire, but our yard could have burned, right? And then last night, right, we, we, we kind of sit down and eat Christmas supper. Laura's fixed everything. And then afterwards, I'm sitting on the couch. And then, you know, Laura says, hey, come here. So I come here. And what happens? Like, um, can, can you tell me why my dishwasher isn't draining any water out of it? Oh, man. So after Christmas dinner, all the tools come out, sitting apart, taking it away, basically to say that our dishwasher went kaput last night, right? All on Christmas, right? So a new mixer, a new dishwasher. And, of course, Laura timed this that she would get a Christmas present, and then I have to go buy this. If not, she'd have got a dishwasher for Christmas, right? Uh, that's just kind of how it rolls in my house. But, you know, we kind of have this idea. Was Christmas what you had planned, right? Christmas is pretty much over which, you know, if we lived a little bit north, you would say brings in the cold weather. People kind of get depressed here. It just brings in a lot of mud uh, and rain, right? He's kind of like, and we're going to say cool weather. It's not cold weather, right? You kind of have this Christmas is over. Um, some of you have already taken your trees down. Uh, you kind of, everything is done. Presents are unwrapped. It Maybe your tree is up, but the tree is empty. Your family has come. They've gone. You have, there's a mess everywhere. And now you're just left with, what now, right? Christmas is over. What do we do? What's the next thing, right? And today I want to use this idea of Christmas is over, did it go the way that you wanted it to, to, to take a, just a quick moment and think about, think about Mary and Joseph, right? Mary and Joseph, they, they have to go to a Bethlehem, they have to go to a city that, was, that um, Joseph was born in, they're in this place, they, there was no room, there was no friends, there was nothing, so they had to go to a manger in which they... Uh, had baby Jesus. They're in a manger. All of a sudden, they're there. Uh, they, they have a baby. They wrap them up with just some shreds of clothes off of their own. Uh, cows and horses and other animals are there. And then we get these shepherds, these murderers, these rapists, these weird men who never bathe, all of a sudden come to this manger and worship this baby Jesus. All these strangers that are there, literally, Literally just hours after she birthed this child, it's a weird Christmas story. It's a weird story for you. Could you imagine? Could you imagine birthing one of your childs in a barn and then all of a sudden 
You know, the, the prison correction people come by and just start worshiping just an hour after you had your child? That would be weird, right? It's not the way that we want our Christmas story. It's not really the way that Mary and Joseph kind of wanted their Christmas story to go. And really, in Scripture, you, if you're reading through Luke chapter 2, the Christmas story, we, he kind of just jumps 12 years of Jesus' story in just a verse or two. But in the book of Matthew, we get just a few more verses, a few more kind of glimpse, a brief moment of looking at how the Christmas story continued on. So this morning, if you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to open up to the book of Matthew, chapter 2. If not, the words will be on the screen behind me. And so Luke chapter 2, Jesus has been born. He's been born in a manger. And then we start in verse 1, and it says, Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Now, as we read the Bible, you read in chapter 1, okay, he was born. And now it says, now after. It doesn't mean immediately after. There's, there's probably several months in there. And we'll, we'll kind of lay out a little bit later why there's several months in there. But Jesus has been born. They're in Bethlehem. They don't want to travel. They're, they're there. And now after Jesus has been born in Bethlehem in, of Judea in the days of Herod the king. Now, Bethlehem is about uh, five or six miles kind of south of Jerusalem, right? So uh, it's just this small little farming community. Bethlehem was really, uh, it's not an important city. It means house of bread. And the only reason that it is of importance is for a few key things. We have Joshua all the way back when they take in over the promised land. Uh, Joshua names it the house of bread. He names it Bethlehem. We have uh, Jacob. He buried, uh, he buried his wife Rachel there. Ruth met Boaz in Bethlehem. Uh, and King David grew up in Bethlehem and uh, tended sheep right around Bethlehem. So Bethlehem is a name that you occasionally see in the Bible, but it's not, a, it's not an important city. Even if you go there today, even though Jesus was born, if you go to Bethlehem today, it, it's, it's not a nice place. It's, it's, uh, if you go to Israel, uh, you, one day maybe we get to go if the world opens back up and you go. It, it's, kind of, it's really kind of one of the more shadier places that you'll go. It's kind of the place that you're kind of like, really, this is Bethlehem? Um, even today, it's not that great of a place. It's a very small town. And so in this, you kind of know that we have Mary and Joseph who had to go there for a census. They birthed their child in a manger. They've been there for several months. And now they're still there it, in a not an important city. But not only does it tell us where, right? So we all know that there was a manger. He was born. We all know that. They stay for a little while. But notice it happened in the days of Herod the king, also known as Herod the Great. Herod the Great um, what was somebody who thought he was great even though he wasn't. Herod the king or Herod the Great his father was named Antipur, and Antipur uh, was a huge friend um, with, um, with the Caesar of Rome. And so in this, you kind of have this connection of his dad who is there, who's over all of Judea, and now he has his son. He's like, really, you're not that great. What are you going to do? And so he makes him a governor or a prefect over Galilee. And so he began during this time to try to build his name, and Herod the Great started to befriend Jews. He started to know them. He started to understand what made them tick. He started to even kind of help them out socially. He even went so far that he married a Jewish woman so that the Jews of Galilee would look at him like he was a great king. But the problem with Herod the Great was he was a really weird guy. Not only was he trying to be a friend of the Jews, but he was very, very, very self-conscious. And in this, he was uh, so afraid and so scared that somebody would take over his, his kind of reign, his governorship. Basically, he killed anybody who threatened it. And so he spent most of his time running out of people out of Galilee that were not Jews. 
So you have the Persians or the Parthian, Parthians, and we'll talk about them in a minute. They were there. He ran them out. There were some other groups of people. He ran them out. And basically, he tried to become this friend of Jews, this person that the Jews looked to. But at the same time, if there was any person that questioned him, he would kill them. And so even though he tried to be the friend of Jews, he actually become one of the most hated men of all time for any Jew, for anybody. It tells us, uh, we, we can read outside of the Bible in Josephus that says he was so hated that when he was going to die, he had every uh, famous Jewish priest uh, and rabbi and actor and anybody that was around, any famous Jew, he had them arrested. He had them put in prison. And he said at the moment of his death that they were to kill all of these famous Jews because he knew that no one, not one person would cry because of his death. But all of Galilee would lament over the death of all of these famous rabbis, teachers, and actors. This guy was a strange guy. And so during this time, kind of setting up this story, we're in Bethlehem. Bethlehem is a part of Galilee. And now we have this Herod the king or Herod the great over this, over this area. And notice it says, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came from Jerusalem. Now, we know all about the wise men, right? We three kings of Orient, right? We have that, right? Most of us have them on our mangers. Most of them are in our house. If you haven't undecorated yet, they might still be up. So when we read these three wise men or these magi, we know a lot. But let's be careful about what we know. These three wise men. Now, the word wise men means magi. It's the word that we get magic or magician from. We see um, magis in Scripture quite often in the Old Testament. Uh, and the biggest part of it, we can see it in the book of Daniel. We learned that uh, in the book of Daniel that we have Nebuchadnezzar, his highest ranking officials in his government that is right below the king, is the magi, is the wise men, is these magicians. And so we kind of have what these magicians are. And, and the idea of this magician doesn't mean like David Copperfield. They're not sawing people in half. They're not pulling rabbits out of their hat. Um, but what was interesting about them is that they were monotheistic. They worshipped one God. They just didn't know who that God was. But in the worship practice of that one God, they took on a lot of the Jewish characteristics, a lot of the Jewish cultures, but not all of them. And in the worship to that one God, they added a lot of pagan practices. It said that these magi, these magicians, these wise men, that from the very beginning of time, they have kept the first fire on the earth, and they keep that forever and ever and ever. And so you kind of have this kind of monotheistic worshiping a single God with some Judaism thoughts, um, with some kind of astrology, with this idea of a fire keeper. And you mix that all in together to say, these were really weird guys, okay? They were just really weird. They believed a lot of things. And because they believed a lot of things, they could make up a lot of things, right? They, they, could, they, they, they weren't contained to one source. They weren't contained to one thing. But because they were making it up as they go, they knew a whole lot. But in the days of Herod the Great, while Joseph, Mary, and Jesus are still in Bethlehem, several months after he's been born, we see that these wise men come from the east, and they come uh, from the east came to Jerusalem. Now, these wise men coming in, uh, tradition tells us, um, not until the Middle Ages, really not until like the 1600s, that they were kings. They were not kings. We we're told that there's three of them. The Bible does not say that there are three. Um, tradition tells us uh, that their names were Caspar, Belthazar, and Melchor, right? Um, and even Melchor is named uh, to be believed um, that he is the three sons of Noah, and that's why one of them is always represented as an as a Ethiopian. 
But we don't see that anywhere in the Bible, right? This is all just tradition. It's all what we have. But what we do know is Mary and Joseph and Jesus are in this little bitty town far away from their home just a couple months after he's been born. And now these these wise men, these magi are coming from the east, coming to Jerusalem. Now, understand what's going on. When they come from the east, we would call that the country of Persia, okay? And just remembering kind of uh, what's going on is King Herod, in the very beginning of his, uh, at the very beginning of his governorship, he kicked out all of the Parthians, all of the Persians. So he's ran out every Persian in all of Galilee. And now we see that some Persian wise men, some, some magi, are now coming back in. In verse 2, they're coming in back to Bethlehem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Where is he? And so basically when you read this in the Greek, it reads in the way that this is um, an ongoing question. It's not that they rode into town and they find the King Herod and they say, where is he, the king of the Jews? It reads uh, with with the participles basically saying, where is he? Have you seen him? Do you know this new? Do you know? As they're walking through town, they're asking every single person, every store owner, every place that they're stopping, that they're asking. And so you can imagine... For, for King Herod, who's pushed out all the Persians, and now you have Persians coming back in. Now remember, there's, there's not three of them, okay? That's just, that's just, we don't know. We don't know how many there are. But we do know that they are magi. We do know that they are wise. They do know that they are smart. So it's not just three. If it was three, they would have came with servants, with cooks, with chefs. They would have came in with a huge entourage. So in a very small town of Bethlehem, only, only, a, only about not even a mile wide, it's a very small town, all of a sudden these Persians are coming in and now they're just, where is he, where is he, where is he? And now all these Persians, not just three on camels, we don't know what they were riding, right? But they're coming in and they're causing this big stir going on. Where is he who is born the king of Jews? For we saw his star when it arose and have come to worship him. We saw his star. It actually translates, we saw the king star. Okay, It's Koleb in the Hebrew or Aster in the Greek. really doesn't matter. But what we know about it is that this does not mean a, a true star in the sky. Okay, that, that word, Caleb or Aster, it means a light, a radiance, something bright. There was something different that was happening about this, a great brilliance. And so these Persians come in, where is the, new, where's the king of the Jews? Where is the king of the Jews? Have you seen him? Have you seen him? And now there's this, there's this big star, there's this, this king star, this great light, for we saw his star When it arose and have come to worship him. Now notice we saw his star. They they no longer see the star. The star, this light, this radiance, we don't know what it is. But remember, what is a magi? They're the keeper of the fire. They're the keeper of the light. They're astrologists. So something, something that God said, something that God did spurred in them that they need to travel to Bethlehem following this light, this radiance, this something that's big. And they get into Bethlehem, and now they don't have it anymore. If it was directly over, if it was directly over the house or directly over the manger, as tradition tells us, they would have just went there. But they've arrived into Bethlehem, a very small city, and now they, they don't see it anymore. The light, the radiance is gone. And so now they're asking, where is the king of the Jews? Where is this? We saw this star, this radiance, this brilliance, and we've come to worship him. This idea of worshiping him is not just singing him praise music, you know, ooh, yeah, okay. It means to fall down, right? It means to fall down, to humble yourself. We've come to fall down. These wise men, they've come to fall down for the king of the Jews. When Herod the king heard this, he was so happy, right? Can can you imagine? 
Can you imagine being a leader of a small countryside and in one of the small kind of no-name kind of trailer park villages, that's just really what Bethlehem is, it's just really just a farming community just kind of on the outskirts, all of a sudden there's some, there's some ruckus going on. Some Persians have invaded again in which he just ran out and they're saying, where is the king of the Jews? Where is the king? We've come to worship him. This star, this light, this, this thing of heavens have guided the way. So you can imagine King Herod, who is trying to put himself on top, for him trying to keep everything kind of, uh, to keep everything under his grasp, you can imagine he's, he's a little involved, right? And it says, not that he was happy, but he was troubled. He was, that word troubled means to be shaken or to be stirred. It's actually uh, translate the of violently taking somebody and shaking them to like, right, to shaking them. And so the Magi who had heard about this, they were happy and they've come to worship. But when King Herod heard this, he has been completely troubled or shaken. He's King uh, King Herod is, is really sitting on a, a powder keg, right? Because we have a Jewish, we have a Jewish community in a Roman-based uh, countryside where Rome runs, and now you have these Persians coming in. And so not only is it a political issue, not only is it a religious issue, but it is also a, it's a war issue, right? And so in this environment of keeping Caesar at number one, but then keeping himself at number one and keeping Persians all the way out, all of this is unfolding in this really small town. And King Herod, he is shaken. He is, he is about to explode. And he was troubled and all of Jerusalem was with him. Not just, not just King Herod was shaken, but all of Jerusalem. You can imagine the events that are unfolding in this very, very small farm town as this entourage rolls in and people are looking in the, in the King of Jews, the Messiah is here and God has led us here. And you can imagine Bethlehem is all of a sudden just exploding in gossip and people talking and you know news reports and all the things that are going out. Everybody is excited. Everybody is being shaken. Verse 4, and assembling all of the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So notice what King Herod does. He, King Herod, because he's a smart political mind, because he is a friend of the Jews, he doesn't go in himself. No, 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 no. He calls up his Jewish friends. Hey, get all the Pharisees together. Get all the scribes together. Get all the lawyers together. Get all the people who know everything about the Old Testament and all the prophecies of this king, of this Christ, of this Messiah. Get them together. And he says, and the chief priests and the scribes of people, he inquired. Notice what he says. Where is this Christ to be born? King Herod is not a dumb man. He knew that these magi, when they're saying that the, the king of the Jews, he instantly knew they're talking about the Messiah. They're talking about the Messiah. See, King Herod, even though he was not Jew, he was a friend of the Jews. He's heard the prophecies. He's not, he knows what the Jews know. He knows that in Micah chapter 5, the prophet of the Old Testament says that the Messiah will be born in the house of bread, will be born in Bethlehem. And now these Persians come in and say, where is the king of the Jews? Where is Christ? Where is the Messiah? And now King Herod, he gets all the Jews. Jewish elites together and he says, hey, you need to figure out, you need to tell me everything you know about the Messiah, the Christ. King Herod, who is lost and is in hell today, he knew that they were talking about the Messiah. He inquired of them, where is the Christ? Where is this Messiah to be born? And they told him, the wise men said this, in Bethlehem of Judea, uh, for so it is written by the prophet." And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Ju Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. 
And so the scribes and the priests get together and they say, oh, oh, King Herod, here's what the Bible says. Here's what God has told us. Here's what prophecy says. And they quote to us Micah uh, chapter 5, verse 2. But notice at the end of that quote, at the end of Micah 5, 2, it says, For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd. What's interesting is, is in the Hebrew, those two words are together. Ruler and shepherd. It means ruler, shepherd. It, it, in the English, we break them apart. Who shall come a ruler who will shepherd. But in the Hebrew, in the prophecy, it says there's a ruler shepherd. This is saying he's not just a shepherd. He's not somebody that's just going to watch, but he is a shepherd of all shepherds. He's shepherds with dominion. There is nobody higher. He is the, what we would call the great shepherd. And so this prophecy that, that, we, that he is being told by his chief priests, by the scribes, by these Jews... He says, tell me everything you know. And he says, the Bible says, God has told us that he's coming out of Bethlehem and he's going to be the ruler shepherd. This is, God, this is not good news if you're the king. If you're King Herod and you're above all of Galilee, you're the governor, the prefect, you've kicked out the Persians, you've befriended the Jews, you've married a Jew, you've done all these crazy things so that you, one day when your dad Antipas dies, that maybe you will take over all of Judea, not just Galilee, and Caesar will come to you and say, well done, good and faithful servant, I'll need all of this, I want you to take over what your dad, he needed to squash this. He has just a small area, just a couple of miles, and he can't even manage it well. And now the Jews are saying that this, this is happening. That Micah tells us that it's coming from Bethlehem, and he's going to be the shepherd ruler. He's going to rule over all things. Well, Herod isn't like, well, that's great. I can't wait till Jesus comes, and I'll just give him my throne. Are you kidding me? This guy is crazy. He, he wants to do exactly what we want to do. We want to reign on high, right? In times in our life, we will always have a choice that says, God, you reign or I reign. And so many times we choose ourselves above him. King Herod is no difference. He doesn't know Jesus. He doesn't want to know Jesus. He doesn't want to know Messiah. He said he's going to do whatever it takes to keep him on top. Verse 7, when Herod summons the wise, men, uh, the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. So he gets the wise men, he calls them out, and he says, oh, oh, great Persians, I'm so glad you came in. Please come to my palace. Let's do a d'oeuvres. He kind of buttered them all up. Oh, tell me about this star. Tell me about this light. Tell me all that you know. But notice what he asked them. He says, what time? He doesn't care about the star. He doesn't care anything about the light. He doesn't care about anything. What time? King Herod is trying to figure out how old is this Messiah? When did you first see this light? God told you it's some way to follow this light, and you've come here. Is it, was it 10 years ago? Was it 20 years ago? Was it 30 years ago? Who? And so King Herod is trying to figure out his enemy, right? Like any great warrior. Who is he? Oh, he, he, oh okay. You just saw it a couple months ago? So, so you're telling me the king of the world, he's an infant? <laughs> oh, okay, this is good, right? I mean, this has got to be calming, right? He's expecting a warrior. He's expecting somebody that's going to take over and lift Jews on high and destroy anybody that's not a Jew. He's expecting a general, a military warrior that's going to lead the Jewish nation to victory above all people. And now the wise men say, oh, we've only saw it for a, a couple months. <laughs> oh, okay. So your Messiah is a baby. Oh, okay, okay. Verse 8, and he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me the word that I too may come and worship him. The king says, oh, okay, well keep searching. Keep searching for this baby, this baby warrior, this baby general. And when you find him, please Please tell one of my servants, I'm going to send some servants with you, and please let them know, and they're going to tell me so that I 
may come and worship too. King Herod did not want to worship. We're going to find out what King Herod wanted to do, right? He wanted to assassinate. He wanted to make sure that this was over. He wanted to make sure he stayed on top. But he told the Magi, oh, please tell me so that I may come and worship, that I may fall on my knees. After, after listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it arose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. Now notice here in verse 9, it, it, it kind of messes with our Christmas story, right? It messes with the little figurines underneath our Christmas tree. They're in Bethlehem, and all of a sudden the light went away. And now these Persians, these Magi's are asking, where does this come from? Where does this come from? Where is he at? Have you seen the king? Do you know this? They don't know. They talk to King Herod. And now as they're leaving King Herod to continue to look for baby Jesus, look what happens. The star that they had seen when it arose that went before them until it came rest over the place. If I told you that I would give you $100 million if you could find the place underneath the North Star. Where would that be at? You wouldn't know. I wouldn't know either. I, I, so I'm not going to have 100 millionaires, right? So when we think of a star in a sky, we think like way up there. And so when we think of the Christmas story, we think of the, the Christmas star, we think of the first star. Some people said it's Venus, some people said it's Jupiter, some people say it's Jupiter and Saturn aligning and making the Christmas star. There's lots of thoughts to this, but here's what we know. There is a light, remember, to get star out of your mind, there's a light, a radiance, something that would guide men through a town that's not even a mile wide. It's not a star, right? It's, it's, not a, it's not a planet. It's not a body on fire millions of light years away. It would have been something that they could have seen that would have been closer, so much so that in a small town in your neighborhood, they could say, it's over that house, Right? Not like, oh, the North Star, okay, I got it, yeah, yeah, um, um, mm, yeah, it's this house, right? You couldn't do that. We see this all the time. We see this in the Old Testament where God would guide people by a pillar of fire, right? And in this, we think something that is huge in expanse, but it was something that a million people could see, but it was when that, when that pillar of fire went right around a boulder, guess what they did? They went right around the boulder, it wasn't something so huge and so massive that they couldn't understand. It was truly a light, a radiance, something that was guiding them that could say it is over this exact place. So it brought them to Bethlehem, then the light disappears. They talk to King Herod, they start looking, and now this light reappears, and it goes before them, and it came rest over the place where the child was. Uh, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with, his, with Mary, his mother. Notice that word. We skip that word a lot. And going into the house, not a stable. They're no longer in a cave. They're no longer in a stable. They're no longer, there's no room for the inn. They've been there for months now. Jesus is no longer new baby, wrapped in swaddling clothes, the shepherds are there. This, this, is, this is months past. I don't know about you, but if you're walking from Persia to Israel, I mean, if you're going to walk, you know, five, you know, four or five hundred miles, some of y'all are really fast and most of you are skinnier than me, but it's still going to take you a while, right? It's still going to take you some time. Some time has passed. And so much so that they've probably rented a house. They're in Bethlehem, they have a new baby, they don't want to travel, they're going into the house, and they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Once again, you have to remember, we don't know all that's happened in these months while Mary and Joseph and Jesus is there, but you can imagine Mary and Joseph having this baby in a cave, 
uh, there and all of a sudden these shepherds come and they start bowing down and they start talking about the angels and they start worshiping Jesus and now all of a sudden months later they get a door, the ring doorbell goes off and they're like, who are these cats? And all go, yeah, let these guys in, right? They open the door and now all of a sudden their house is invaded with all of these Persians and as soon as they see baby Jesus, they instantly fall down and start worshiping. They have to go back to the manger, right? They have to go back and be like, wow, what's going on? Now, we don't know if there's, if it was only the shepherds and only the wise men, but I would have to believe that probably in between, though, there was probably a lot of people that came. People were starting to hear as the shepherds are going around and telling the story. People would travel in to Bethlehem to see what the angels were talking about, to see if this is even true. This is probably not the second time that people have fell down and start worshiping baby Jesus. But now we have these, these guys who are, who are smart, who have this huge entourage, who have gifts and are probably elaborate and very, um, very different. They're Persians. These guys aren't Jews. They look different. They talk different. But they come into the house and they start falling down and worshiping him. Then opening the treasures, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And just like the wise men, there's so many stories and so many explanations to the gifts. We're not going to go through them. But what we do know is gold is good, right? Gold is good. It's a precious metal. One of the best things that existed. Frankincense was something that was used um, for special occasion. It was an incense that was burning for inside of the temple. And then you have myrrh that was used. They would mix that with spices that when you would, when somebody would die, it was a part that would cover the embalming process. And so at the best, we can say, man, these are great, some, these are great gifts, and they are, they are good for the royalty, they're good for his deity, they're good for his humanity. I mean, you can preach a whole sermon on this, and many pastors have done that. But what we do know is they brought gifts that would cost way more than the house that they're staying in Bethlehem. They brought gifts that probably cost more than all of Bethlehem. And so they bring these gifts, these these prized gifts, and they fall down and they worship him. But notice when they give the gifts, it's not like they worshiped them and gave them gifts, but giving the gifts was a part of their worship. Just like it is today, right? As, as we give to the church, as we expand, the, as we expand our um, reach of the community, as we want to move out to the gospel, as we want to reach kids, as we were looking forward, it's not like we worship and we give. It's that our giving is a part of our worship. God, you are great. You deserve everything, and I I don't have everything to give you, but I do want to do my part in moving your message forward. And so as they were worshiping, they gave these gifts. In verse 12, and being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own uh, country by another way. So as they were there for worship, we don't know how long they were there, um, I can't imagine that they would travel months to just stay there for 30 minutes and go home, right? Remember when you were a kid and you would go to your aunts and your uncles and, you know, the weird people at Christmas time, and you're like, Mom, how long do we got to stay here? How long do we got to stay here? It's not that, right? They, they, they don't want to do that, right? They've traveled all this way. They want to hear the story. They probably want to hear about uh, the, the, the Joseph and the, the dreams that he had. He, they want to talk to Mary and hear about the angel and about the shepherds. I mean, they're getting all of this. They've traveled so far that they've come, but sometime in that space, They've been warmed in a dream. God has warned them, don't go back the way you came. Don't go through, don't go through town and tell Herod where is that. Just go another way. Now, when they had departed, when, when the wise men were gone, when the entourage was gone, when the party was gone, when everything was over, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there, remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child and destroy him. So you can imagine, Herod, is, uh, the wise men are there, they've had this big party, now they're, they're gone, and now they're getting kind of back to normal. Christmas is over, the party's over, the celebrations is over, everything's happening, Mary and Joseph are cleaning up from all the mess and doing everything, they're back to cutting the grasses, they're, they're coming back to trimming the bushes, right? I mean, this week, I gotta trim my bushes, my bushes are crazy, 
right? You're like, it's Christmas week, and it's like it's 100 degrees this week. You know, you're like, we got to trim the bushes, right? Back to normal life. Christmas is over. Back to normal. And so as they're getting back to normal life, an angel comes again to Joseph in a dream, just like he did before Jesus, and now he comes back. Do you think Joseph was like, well, I don't know if that was really an angel. Man, that, you know, that, that Turkish sandwich, you know, I, you, know I, you would have known, right? He'd have been like, oh, my goodness. So this angel comes in a dream, and he says, arise and take your child and your mother and flee to Egypt. Here we go again, right? They had to go to Bethlehem. While she was pregnant, do all that, no room in the inn, go through all of this. It's been several months now, and now he gets another vision that says, arise and go. Can I just be honest? I'm glad I'm not Joseph, because I'd be like, come on, God, like, are you kidding me? Are you seriously kidding me? I mean, we got, we got your son right here. I mean, why do we have to go? Can't you make the other people go? Can't you make them? Like, why? You're just like, get up and go to Bethlehem. Get up and go to Egypt. Like, come on. Have you ever traveled with a, with a toddler? Have you ever traveled with a little baby? All they do is cry and poop, cry and poop. It's forever. It takes forever to do anything, Right? But this, this angel comes and he says, you need to go and you need to flee to Egypt. That word flee is the word fiego. It's the word that we get fugitive. It means to, to truly to escape something. It doesn't mean, okay, get up and tell everybody bye and pack your bags, get everything ready. It means to literally get up and go. There's an emergency. You need to get out right now. And so we're going to Egypt. Now, Egypt is only about 75 miles away from Galilee. It's not really that far. How many of you have walked 75 miles this week? Right? You know, not many of us, right? But January 1, we will all work 75 miles a day, right? Because we're going to get slim and trim, right? But not during Christmas break. 75 miles isn't that big a deal. But for a Jew going to Egypt, it's not just getting to the border, they really needed to travel about 100 miles inside of Egypt to a place called Alexandria. Now, a lot of us has heard of Alexandria. They got the famous library, the Hanging Gardens. You have all this stuff. But what's interesting is there's a guy, Alexander the Great. He made a city named after himself. How great is that, right? Alexandria. And Alexandria was a place, it was a refuge for all the Jews, for all the Jews to go to. And it was a place that they could go. And even though it was within Egypt, even though it was underneath the kind of Egypt's desire, it was a huge Jewish city. We even know about this time there's about a million Jews in Alexandria. So it's not like a small group of people. There's a lot of people. So they needed to travel about 175 miles by foot and donkey with, with a little baby. Sign me up, right? That sounds great, you know, just wonderful. I mean, they didn't even have iPads back then to put on like, you know, like a cartoon. I mean, it would have been horrible, right? But this is what they said. You need to flee. You need to go to Egypt. Um, there, until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Notice what the angel says. You need to go 175 miles and just go there until I tell you. What? No, can I, can I get a calendar? Can I get something on my iCal? Can, can you help me out? Like, what is, and so God just says, basically, you need to go and trust me. And, and I won't leave you there, but you got to go until I come again, right? Until I tell you when. And look what happened. And Joseph arose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. Now, this was only a couple months. So after they left, Herod dies within about four or five months. Uh, and, and so this happened, so they're in Egypt, and this all happened, all of this happened to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Notice, all of this happened. The Magi come and meet King Herod, they kind of get the, the city Bethlehem ruffled up, right? Galilee's ruffled up. They go, God sends them a vision, they go another way, and now King Herod is mad, he wants to kill this Messiah, all this happens, so now he has to go to Alexandria, about 175 miles, only for a couple months. Do you think God could have kept him uh, safe for a couple months? Well, sure, they didn't have to go 175 miles. 
to keep them safe. God could have just said, invisibility. Woo. You know, he could have done anything he wanted. But he sends them 175 miles south to Alexandria to be in a Jewish city to probably go down and tell a million Jews about the Messiah, about the angels, about all that's happened, to start telling about God is faithful, God has not forgotten Israel. And he's done all of this so that we can say, out of Egypt I called my son, which is a prophecy back in Hosea chapter 11. But what's interesting is that prophecy in Hosea, it's not about Jesus. It was about Israel and Egypt at the very beginning. It was about Moses. And Hosea was saying, like God said, I'm going out of Egypt, I'm going to call you. Out of Egypt, I will protect you. Out of Egypt, I will feed you. Out of Egypt, I will bring you salvation. And now, 700 years later, 1,400 years after Moses, God is saying the same thing. Out of Egypt, I will bring salvation. Out of Egypt, I will bring you food that you will never thirst. Out of Egypt, uh, out of, I will bring you food you will never hunger. Out of Egypt, I will give you water that will never thirst. It's the same thing. So a prophecy that was fulfilled with Moses is also a prophecy that was fulfilled with Jesus. And so all of this happened. Everything that we've read today has happened so that God would be faithful to his own word, to the own promise he made to a country of Israel. Out of Egypt, I called my son. Verse 16, then Herod when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became happy. He became furious. He was mad. I am the king. How dare they? He became furious. That word furious is the word thumo. It means a loss of all of your ability. It means that you're so mad you, you can't even express how mad you are, right? You're just like, ah. He he became furious. He went off the deep end, and he sent and he killed all the male children in Bethlehem in all that region who were two two years old or under. When 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 the Magi came, they said, how long have you seen the star? We've seen the star for four, five, six months. We don't really know. It's just kind of a guesstimate. You're just like, oh, okay, so you're saying that the Messiah is about six months, right? Okay, well, now they've left. Now they're in Egypt. A couple months have gone by. So at this time, probably Jesus is around one. And so Herod, the, Herod, the, Herod says, well, I'm going to make sure I kill him. Everybody two and under, okay? Two and under. Now, I, I don't know about you guys, but when you say two, we think one and two, Right? But you're two until the day before your third birthday, right? That makes sense, right? You're two. Unless you're, like, you're those weird parents who are like, oh, my kid's like 97 months old. They're like, okay. Well, that's, how, what is that? I don't even know what that means. I'm not that good at multiplication, right? You're like, right when you say that. So, oh, your kid's two. Oh, yeah, he turns three tomorrow. So basically any kid one day under three to being born, King Herod is going to destroy. He kills them all to make sure he would get the Messiah, But he didn't because he was in Egypt. Who would reign two years old and under according to the time that he ascertained from the wise men. What what does all this got to mean, right? Your Christmas may have not went the way that you you planned. Maybe your casserole didn't turn out. Maybe your turkey was a little bit dry. Uh, Maybe your family is weird, okay? Uh, Whatever happened, right, our Christmases go differently than we want. And even that first Christmas, it didn't go the way that really anybody would paint the picture. But out of this story, out of this kind of after Christmas story, we really get three glimpses of three different people. These three different people have three different views on who Jesus is. And today, really just the question comes to you is, which one of these three are you? Are you King Herod? Are, are Are you hostile? Are you jealous of Jesus? King Herod was the king, and he didn't want anybody to be above him. There is nobody that will control my life. There's nobody that will tell me what to do. There is nobody, and a lot of times we are those people. A lot of times we have that that says there is no one who's going to be king of my life other than me. And that's where King Herod was. Are you a King Herod? Do you have your life above that of Jesus's? Another group of people that we saw were the the chief priests and the scribes. 
these Jewish kind of people that, that, uh, that King Herod called. And he said, what does the Bible say? What, do, what, is, what did God have to say on who the Messiah was? And these people, the chief priests and the scribes, they were religious, but they weren't really that interested. Well, see, a lot of times there's people around us and maybe people in this room that they're religious. They, they come to church they might give, they might serve, they might go to Sunday school, they might work in the nursery, they might do this and that, and they're religious, and they know what the Bible says, and they know what prophecies say, and they know all the right answers, but when it really comes down to it, they don't really care about Jesus. They're just religious. It's just something they've done. It's the way that they've been raised. It's, it's all about a place and not a person. So are you like King Herod, that you're jealous and you're going to put yourself above Jesus? Or are you a chief priest or a scribe, somebody who's religious, but you don't really care about Jesus? Or thirdly, or are you like a magi, somebody that comes and truly is searching and worshiping Jesus? Can, can I say before we met Jesus, we were a bunch of messed up people. We might have been monotheistic. We might have taken other things from other religions, and we might have thought God is this and God is that, and we've done this, and we came from there, and a lot of us came from a lot of different places, right? International city, woo woo, right? We've, we've all come from different places, but we all came, and when we met Jesus, everything was changed. Everything was different. And it was truly the ability of the Magi to come. And when they saw Jesus, the only thing they could do was fall on their faces. Was to, to worship, to completely fall, to humble themselves and say, God, your way and not my way. Kind of the complete opposite of Herod, right? You have Herod who says, my way and not God's way. You have the chief priests and the scribes, the religious people. I'm going to do what is right, but I, it's, it's still really about my way. I don't really care anything about Jesus. Or you have, the, you have the magi, you have the wise men that come and say, it's all about your way, God, and not about my way. Let me fall down and humble myself. You have King Herod who stands up and says, look at me. You have the chief priest and the scribes that says, look at all that I'm doing. And then you have the wise man who says, I am nothing. Let me fall down and look at him. Who are you this morning? Are you King Herod? Do you put yourself above Jesus Christ? Scripture tells us that any person that does that is not worthy of heaven. Are you a chief priest? Are you a religious person? Yeah, I come to church, I, I do good, I do this, I do that. Scripture tells us that works will not get you in heaven. It is only by faith in Jesus Christ. It's not by what you do. It's by who you believe in. Or are you a magi who comes and says, don't even look at me. I am worthless. Look at him who is worthy. This morning, are you King Herod? Are you a religious person? Or are you a magi? And not only what are you today, but what are you going to be for 2022? Jesus isn't a one-day decision. It's a life-changing decision. As we sit over the next week and we think about how many salads we're going to eat and how much weight we're going to lose and how much healthier we're going to eat and how many times we're going to do this and how many books we're going to read and all the fun things that we say that we're going to do in January. Does, does your January include making Jesus higher and making you lower? Because if it doesn't, you're probably not a magi. You're probably not a wise man or a wise woman. You're probably a religious person or a King Herod. Who are you? You already know. Which one are you and who will you be for 2022? Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you so much. We thank you for Christmas. We thank you for the ability to get together and to praise who you are 
and why you've come to this earth. Father, even now that Christmas is over, as we look at this Christmas story, it is not a story that anybody would really want. It's not a story of in which this world would make. It's not a Christmas story that even Mary and Joseph would have wanted. But it's a way that you chose to bring your son. That you would be faithful to your word. That you would be faithful to Israel. That you would be faithful to us. That while we deserve nothing, you stepped out of heaven to come to this earth to show that our, that our only hope in this life is to exalt and to make you higher, to make you greater, and to make us smaller. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this Christmas season. We thank you for the ability to see our friends and our family. But, Father, we ask that you would be on our hearts, you would be on our minds, that when we see our friends and family, that we would be able to tell them the true reason for the season. That even though for many of us Christmas is over, we will continue this year to continue on to tell of why you came. That why the God of the universe would step out of heaven to come to earth to be crucified so that you could be resurrected, so that we could know you. Father, help us to be more like the wise men and less like the religious elites and less like King Herod. Father, we thank you so much for who you are. In your precious name, amen.